Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How wonderful it is to see you here. I am Shithij Kapoor. I'm the president and principal of King's College London, and it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's event, the 12th annual Fulbright Distinguished Lecture, which will be delivered by none other than John Kerry, the United States Special Presidential Envoy for Climate. The Fulbright Distinguished Lecture was launched a number of years ago as a collaboration involving the US-UK Fulbright Commission, the Loy B. Roth Foundation, and three universities, King's College London, the University of Edinburgh, and the Pembroke College, Oxford. Previous speakers in this series have included Nobel laureates like Harold Warmus for medicine, Joseph Stiglitz for the economics, and others with the likes of David Miliband, Nicholas Stern, Janet Napolitino, all of whom have given their analysis of timely issues of international importance. But nothing could be more important than the topic we'll be talking about today. In fact, it comes fast on the heels of COP27, and I think COP27 left us with a very clear message of the scale of the challenge, the urgency of action that is needed, but also with the hope that we were able to establish a historic fund to help poorer nations that are being devastated by climate change. Now, we at King's are acutely aware of our responsibility as a university in this regard. Um, as it happens, over the last 15 years, we have halved our carbon emissions per unit of activity at King's. We were also one of the first universities to divest fully out of fossil fuels. But in the end, the job of the university is not just to make sure that their estate is climate compliant. I think our real opportunity is to transform education and research in relationship to climate. So leveraging the convening power of kings in the UK and internationally, we work very closely with governments and policymakers to deliver strong contributions to the challenge of climate change. At the heart of this, of course, are our world-leading climate scientists, many of whom are in this room, a welcome to them, and the work that they carry out in authoring reports for the IPCC and, of course, for advising the UK Parliament with the evidence that is needed on these issues. But that's not all. We have the King's Centre for Climate Law and Governance, which is a standout of example of how we are leading thinking on international legal and governance responses to challenges of climate change. But perhaps the greatest asset of a university are its students. So we are focused on training the next generation of global change makers. We now offer sustainability and climate change education through more than 100 modules to our students across the nine faculties. But in the end, it won't be just our staff or our students or our buildings that will change, change climate. It is actually whether we can convince the public around the world that this is something of importance. So one thing we take very seriously is the issue of public attitudes. And that is why the Policy Institute at King's, in collaboration with Ipsos Mori, has just produced a new line of research. And in fact, you can get a copy of it, if you haven't as yet, which explores the public attitude towards climate, climate change, and what governments should do and what people are willing to do, both in the US and in the UK. So I hope you'll get a chance to see that. So as we at King's mobilize our research and expertise to respond to the climate crisis, we are indeed honored to welcome Mr. Kerry this evening to discuss some of its pressing themes. In a moment soon, I will hand over to Catherine Crockart, who is the Minister Counselor for Public Affairs at the US Embassy in London. She will formally introduce Mr. Kerry, after which Mr. Kerry will deliver his lecture. And he will then be joined by Professor Franz Burkhardt, who is our Professor of Environment, Society and Climate here at King's, and Baroness Helene Heyman, who is the co-chair of the Peers for the Planet, the House of Lords Climate and Biodiversity Action Group. So with that, uh, we will finish then the evening with Sarah Sorrell, the chair of the US-UK Fulbright Commission, who will close tonight's events with thanks. So may I welcome you all again, and may I welcome Catherine to the stage to introduce Mr. Kerry. Catherine. Thank you so much. What a great pleasure it is to be here tonight. I want to thank our hosts, Principal Kapoor and King's College London, and our partners at the University of Oxford, the University of Edinburgh, 
and the Lois Roth Foundation. Thanks as well to the true superheroes on the US-UK Fulbright Commission team, including Executive Director Maria Belinska, who's sitting here in the front row. And to all of you here tonight, thank you all for joining us for such an important conversation, and especially all of those current and former Fulbrighters in the audience. The Fulbright Distinguished Lecture is a can't-miss annual event, and this year is particularly meaningful. Not only because we're joined by an absolutely extraordinary speaker in John Kerry, but also because in just a few weeks, the US-UK Fulbright Commission begins celebrating its 75th anniversary. For those of us fortunate enough to serve as commissioners, this lecture and all of your participation in it tonight truly represents the direction we're headed with our key strategic objectives. First, to widen participation through inclusive excellence and second, to support our Fulbright community of change makers to tackle together the world's big challenges, such as the climate crisis. We are proud of the many Fulbrighters, both British and American, who are engaged in this work. And we are proud of the new programs we've created at the Commission to advance understanding of climate change, from our virtual teaching awards to our work in civic science that connects science and research with diverse communities. I am confident that in another decade or two, today's Fulbrighters will be the ones delivering this lecture. But as for tonight, well, there is a certain stratosphere of person whose accomplishments are so formidable, whose values so inspirational, and whose accomplishments so well known to people the world over that it's often said they need no introduction. Our speaker this evening is in this category. It also must be said that tonight's speaker has more than earned an introduction, and I'm honored to give it my very best. It's no exaggeration to say that John Kerry is the consummate American statesman. From 2013 to 2017, he was the 68th US Secretary of State. For 28 years, he represented Massachusetts in the US Congress, and from 2009 to 2013, he was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He was the Democratic Party's nominee for President of the United States in 2004. Secretary Kerry served two combat tours of duty in the United States Navy in Vietnam, for which he received a Silver Star, a Bronze Star, and three Purple Hearts. You might say his public service experience was well established by then because, as he shared with my colleagues and me on his first day as Secretary of State in 2013, he was actually issued his first diplomatic passport at the age of 11 when he accompanied his family to his father's posting in Berlin. And today, Secretary Kerry's world-changing leadership is focused on a singular issue, the climate crisis, which President Biden has called an existential threat and a code red for humanity. He was sworn in as the first ever special presidential envoy for climate on January 20th, 2021. And in this capacity, he is also the first ever principal entirely dedicated to the issue of climate change to sit on the National Security Council. He is uniquely qualified for this role, having spent his entire career in the US Senate building a powerful legislative record on climate and environmental issues. In addition, in 2007, he and his wife, Teresa Heinz Carey, wrote This Moment on Earth, which elevated the work of inspiring environmentalists across the United States. In 2019, he launched the World War Zero Coalition to bring together scientists, politicians from every political background, and influential activists to tackle environmental issues like unclean water and air pollution that disproportionately affect marginalized groups. And from the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, right up to COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh just a few weeks ago, he has for decades negotiated advanced, advocated for, and successfully advanced science-based international climate policy. And last, but not least, he's a member of our extended US-UK family. His daughter, Vanessa, was a Fulbright scholar studying medicine just over the street from here at LSE from 2004 to 2005. There is simply no better person to speak with us tonight about the urgency of global climate action. Please join me in extending a very warm welcome to the 2022 Fulbright Distinguished Lecturer, Special Presidential Envoy, John Kerry.
Catherine, thank you very, very much. I, I happily uh, accept the nomination. <laughs> uh, that was a wonderful introduction. I really mean that. I know we always, you, you, you pegged it. You said he doesn't need one. But I tell you, I don't know anybody who is a recovering politician who doesn't love to have one. So. <laughs> Uh, I thank you very much for a glowing uh, introduction. In fact, it, it prompts me. I heard I heard uh, the president, President Kapoor, say a formal introduction. Uh, so I thank you for a very formal and generous uh, introduction. I'll just share with all of you this story came to mind as I was thinking about the introduction of the introduction. Um, there was a time when, in American politics, the only way you made your name was to be on the Chautauqua circuit or, you know, be speaking. And it was through speaking that you really gained a reputation. And uh, way back when, there was a United States senator from New York by the name of Chauncey Depew, and he was chosen one day to introduce the then president of the United States, William Howard Taft. Now, at that point in his life, ladies and gentlemen, William Howard Taft was a man of massive girth. I mean, the closest he could get to the podium was about where I am right now. And there was no microphone. And so this long dais was there, table, and he was sitting at the table, finally got his moment to introduce William Howard Taft, and he gets going. He starts getting wound up, you know, this is his moment. Oh, my ladies and gentlemen, just look here. We have the President of the United States visiting with us. What a moment. Just look at him sitting there, pregnant, <laughs> with hope, <laughs> pregnant, with courage. And, and William Howard Taft soaks this in. And then he kind of gets up very deliberatively. And he kind of rubs his tummy and he walks up to the podium, says, pregnant, eh? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have news for you. If it is to be a boy, we will call him courage. And if it is to be a girl, we will call her hope. But if, as I suspect, it is merely gas, <laughs> we will call it Chauncey Depew. <laughs> so anyway, you got to be, you got to be really careful what you say in an introduction. That's the lesson or the moral of that story. Um, what a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm, I'm very happy to be with you. I want all the current Fulbrighters to stand up and be recognized. Will all the current Fulbrighters, come on, just stand up and everybody give them a hand. And that is as much as you will be celebrated until you accomplish these marvelous things you've all set out to do. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to all those of you from King's College, London, and President Kapoor, uh, and the Policy Institute and the Fulbright Commission Chair, Sarah Sorrell, uh, it's wonderful for me to be back here in London, and I'm delighted to be here, though I had a horrible six-hour delay in Dulles last night, and it sort of wiped out our, our morning here. But I'm really, really happy to be in London, one of my favorite cities. And I thank you uh, for inviting me at this very, very important time. It's also particularly nice for me to be able to be here with those of you who give life to Senator Fulbright's vision of a world in which there are no obstacles to learning, understanding, or collaboration. And I'm especially grateful for the ways in which you are reimagining the power of this Fulbright Initiative uh, in an age in which climate change is, in fact, very much an existential issue. I personally have long admired the Fulbright Initiative for reasons I will explain to you. Uh, including, as was mentioned, uh, I am the proud father of a Fulbrighter, my daughter, Dr. Vanessa Carey, who uh, really found her sense of mission uh, studying on a Fulbright scholarship here, and she has a passion in her that has become her life's work, uh, running a global health 
uh, enterprise called SEED, Global Health, in which he tries to build uh, healthcare capacity, particularly in Africa, but on a global basis. And in addition to that, my own journey as an advocate and as a public citizen was shaped enormously by Chairman Fulbright himself. I remember when we 5,000 veterans strong marched on Washington in 1971 and insisted on sleeping on the mall and Richard Nixon insisted on arresting us, but he didn't because the police said they wouldn't enforce that. And so I was a young veteran home from Vietnam using my voice to speak out against a war in which I felt America had lost its way. But it was Bill Fulbright who personally gave my voice a megaphone, unlike anything we vets would have imagined achieving, uh, allowing me to speak directly to the American people and the world testifying in front of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And that, of course, uh, is a fundamental part of Bill Fulbright's legacy, speaking the truth as he did, even when it was particularly difficult. He could have been a senator for life, believe me, but he refused to just duck the, uh, the difficult issues and live in the comfort of the United States Senate. Uh, he came to believe very deeply that U.S. foreign policy was misguided, and he chose to use his voice and his perch as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee to turn that policy around, and despite the critics, despite the long odds of success. Today, more than 50 years later, on the issue of the climate crisis, I believe deeply that uh, it is safe to say that we all face a challenge that even more, that, that is more deadly, more immediate to every single nation on the planet than almost any other issue. The choice for all of us should be as clear and compelling as any issue that we've ever faced, nuclear war, chemical warfare, cyber warfare, this is destruction that is unfolding on a regular and measurable basis right now. So we need to, again, speak the truth. But more importantly, the whole world has to choose to act on that, as President Kapoor said, whether or not people broadly will demand of their leaders what is common sense and based on truth. The truth is that in the United States, in the first three quarters of this year alone, we have suffered 15 separate billion-dollar extreme weather events, disasters. The truth is that this summer, the Arctic was 70 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. The Antarctic was 100 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. And on one single day, for the first time ever, three continents, all together simultaneously, recorded record days of heat. On this continent, all of you lived through the truth of the climate crisis with record-breaking heat waves. Germany's Rhine River was at inches in certain places, paralyzing commerce in France. The most severe drought on record warmed river water so much that it couldn't be used to cool the nuclear reactors that the country relies on for 70% of its energy. Devastating flooding in South Africa, Mozambique, Nigeria, Uganda, killed hundreds and displaced tens of thousands. In Pakistan, 30 million people in one event were displaced. No country was spared, no matter how large, no economy was spared, no matter how powerful. No one was immune to this hottest year on record. After a 2021 in which unstoppable rains flooded Zhengzhou and families drowned to death on the subway, so that this year China suffered skyrocketing temperatures that slowed the Yangtze River to a muddy trickle. And here's the most troubling truth of all. Based on what scientists are telling us, not politicians, not ideologues, but scientists whose job it is to chase 
the truth. They are telling us that because of the damage already done to Earth by the emissions that are already put in the atmosphere and still increasing global emissions year on year, because of this, even this past perilous year that I just described may well prove to be better than almost any year ahead of us. Unless, of course, we repair the planet at the pace that science demands and that we strengthen our adaptive capacity. It is written in the Bible that the truth will set you free. Well, I'm absolutely convinced that we will free ourselves from the grip of unabated carbon, and we will ultimately get to a low-carbon, no-carbon economy. We will get there. But the truth is, given our current pace, it is impossible to be convinced, at least I am not, that we will meet the challenge of the scientists to get there in time to avoid the worst consequences of the crisis. That is what they warned us of in 2018 in the seminal report of the UN IPCC. That is why they warned us of the dire consequences of a two-degree world as compared to a 1.5-degree world. And we have to continue to enlist countries that have yet to align their targets with 1.5 degrees in order to achieve that goal. There's a reason why they chose 1.5. Not because of politics, not because of some personal whim or fancy of one leader or another in the world. They chose it because of mathematics and physics and some biology and chemistry, but mostly the mathematics and physics. That's what this fight is all about. Because every decimal point beyond the scientific benchmark of 1.5 increases the consequences dramatically. And that is not conjecture. It has been proven. We see the evidence, Mother Nature screaming at us daily, monthly, yearly. And almost everything happening today are the predictions that I heard in Rio in 1992, that we heard from Jim Hansen in 1998 when he testified to us in Congress. There's no surprise, except perhaps for the intensity and the scope. Now, a little more than two years ago, President-elect Biden asked me to serve as his special envoy for climate. And at the time, the world was rushing toward climate chaos, frankly. It was a perilous moment. Any hope of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius was slipping faster, further and further away. And from the first day of the Biden administration, when the president immediately rejoined the Paris Agreement, we've been sprinting to make up for lost time. It's been a full steam ahead effort to confront the crisis both at home and in partnership around the world. One year ago, thanks to large measure to the work of Alok Sharma and the UK, we left COP26 in Glasgow with 65% of the largest economies of the world committed to the 2030 targets in line with 1.5 degrees. That's pretty good. The International Energy Agency calculated that if all of the commitments and initiatives that were put forward by Glasgow were fully implemented, by 2050, we could limit warming to 1.8 degrees. That was a moment, frankly, of revelation about what is possible if we do our work. Now, one year later, we just finished up at COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh. And the IEA now tells us that if the new commitments that were added on in Sharm, if, if those that have been announced are now fully implemented, guess what? We could now, in fact, limit warming to 1.7 degrees. And that's only with 65%, maybe 70% of global GDP now committed. So that is a journey of possibility. Think about it that way, that we have gone from well over two degrees to 1.8 to now 1.7. 
but we only reach our destination on this journey if we implement our commitments. It's up to us. Now, as we know too well, uh, commitments are not the same thing as actions. We need action today, not tomorrow. The fact is that we have a long way to go to keep our promise to you, you Fulbrighters and younger generation, that will live with the rewards of our action or the consequences of our inaction. And what leaps out at me is not that this challenge presents us with impossibilities. It actually presents us with all kinds of possibilities. We know what we have to do. There's no mystery. We have to reduce emissions from unabated fossil fuels. Fairly straightforward and simple challenge. We have to cut methane and other climate super pollutants. And we have to stop deforestation. And we actually know how to do all of this. Not yet all of it at scale, but we know how the basics work. The mission now is to double down, triple down, quadruple down, to implement real projects and deploy real dollars, which enables us to further enhance global ambition and hold everyone accountable. Just think about what we can do together. Over the course of this year, more than 30 countries heeded the call from Glasgow, and they strengthened their 2030 targets. Now, I want to point out to you here that there are a number of things that happened at Sharm el Sheikh people aren't that aware of. So it wasn't just a loss and damage provision that captured the effort of everybody, important as that is. And I'll talk about it in a few minutes. But take note, in Australia, a new government elected with a climate mandate committed to a 1.5 aligned target. Brazil's new incoming administration, I met with President Lula in Charm, is ready to go to work to reinstate the old policies and put new ones in place to save the Amazon. In other words, two of the planet's biggest outliers this year have declared their intent to be global leaders. In addition, Mexico is significantly strengthening its 2030 target. I made five visits to Mexico with President Lopez Obrador, and he turned a corner and came around and said they're going to raise their NDC, they're going to increase their renewables, they're going to set a renewable target, and they're going to try to, uh, to, to become a major force in the provision of North American energy, not just for Mexico, but for the USA, for Canada, and potentially for Central and Latin America. That's an exciting vision on which any number of jobs and possibilities can be created. Alongside the G20 summit in Bali, my friends, Indonesia committed, after a year of negotiating with them, to peak its power sector emissions seven years earlier, by 2030 and to dramatically increase the deployment of renewable energy and to begin to transition off of coal. Egypt committed to strengthen its 2030 target and quadruple its renewable energy capacity. And in the United States, we have passed the most significant environmental legislation in our history, putting us on track to meet our ambitious goal of reducing emissions 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels in 2030. What's more, our historic investments in clean energy, in infrastructure, will help other countries deliver stronger climate ambition by driving down the cost of clean energy technologies everywhere. We're not doing this just for us. We're doing this because we believe these technologies are the future on a global basis, and we will share those technologies as we develop them. And the signals being sent by governments are, in turn, igniting innovation and the promise of a new wave of technologies to help us more deeply decarbonize in the decades to come, whether it's direct air carbon capture or better battery storage or a different kind of storage or carbon capture utilization and storage or green hydrogen or any number of the 46 critical technologies designated by the IEA. Last year alone, my friends, climate tech companies raised more than $165 billion aimed at technologies ranging from all those I just listed. 
Bill Gates is exploring smaller, safer, zero emission nuclear reactors. A number of novel efforts are now creating decarbonized fuels from renewable energy and CO2 and literally turning pollution into power. Prince William's Earthshot Prize is rewarding environmental innovators for the next generation of climate advancements. And the beauty of all of these innovative efforts, folks, is that there is no one-size-fits-all solution from major energy importers worried about energy security to petrostates that are looking beyond the horizon. Everybody has a role in, to play in, in scaling up uh, new technologies. And I think we have a locked, uh, a locked uh, teleprompter, so I'm going to try to find my place here, folks. And, we will continue. Oh, now it's working again. Uh, on climate technology, uh, the possibilities are limitless, really, uh, but so are, are, are the benefits in the long run if we do what we know we can do. And in Sharm el-Sheikh, I'm proud that we put a number of initiatives on the table which I think are going to have a major impact, and they will drive action in this critical decade. And what's important about them is they're not just measured uh, uh, on the basis of uh, what they will do to specifically meet your NDC. Most of these things are outside of the NDC, and these individual programs are things that are going to make an extraordinary difference to helping to meet the 1.5 degrees. Let me give you an example. In Paris, methane was hardly discussed. I remember I had the privilege of leading our team in Paris. We had long fights over 1.5 and other things but not methane, barely mentioned. In Glasgow, it was put front and center. And leaving Sharm el-Sheikh, we're now at 150 countries, fully three quarters of the nations of the world, have now joined us in the Global Methane Pledge to slash global methane emissions by 30% by 2030. You know what that does? That is the equivalent of every single automobile, every truck, every airplane, every ship in the world going to zero emissions by 2030. It's a huge grab. And now 95% of countries in the world are going to include methane in their NDC targets for 2030. My friends, methane is responsible for half of the warming of the planet to date. It is also 20 to 80 times more destructive than CO2. It is the most destructive gas. And tackling methane is, in fact, the cheapest, quickest, fastest, most effective way to begin to reduce the pollution that is creating this problem and to keep 1.5 degrees within reach. It's also critical that we end deforestation, which is depriving us of the very lungs of our planet. Along with Ghana, the United States is co-chairing the UK-inspired. Zach Goldsmith has played a critical role in this, and I salute his leadership on it. But we're, 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 we're going to now chair with Ghana the Forest and Climate Leaders Partnership, uh, which will make Glasgow Forest Declaration actually a reality. And by halting and reversing the forest loss and land degradation, we can deliver up to 30 percent of the emissions reductions needed to meet our Paris goals. Now, if shipping were a country, folks, it would be the eighth largest emitter in the world. That's why, along with Norway, we have launched the Green Shipping Challenge with countries, with ports, and with companies announcing more than 40 individual steps aimed at decarbonizing international shipping. We also built something called, <clears throat> excuse me, the First Movers Coalition which now includes 65 major companies in the world, FedEx, Google, Apple, uh, Salesforce, uh, uh, United Airlines, Delta, Boeing, I mean, a whole bunch of different players, Lafarge Wholesome, Cement Maker, so forth. And, and they have proactively taken steps, $12 billion they are expending towards zero emission shipping and trucking. And they're doing it by proactively purchasing green uh, products by declaring they'll pay the green premium in order to be able to accelerate the transition, create a demand signal that gets sent to the marketplace. 
And so this will help us scale up technologies in the hardest to abate sectors. And they're making an incredible contribution to the expansion of the new green market as rapidly as possible. None of these things are measured automatically by an NDC, but all of them are gonna have an impact. Each of these new country commitments, each of these partnerships brings us a step closer to the possibility of keeping 1.5 degrees alive. So my friends, coming out of Glasgow, it was 1.8. Coming out of Charm, it's 1.7. And if countries take the aggressive action required by their short and long-term goals, we can get there. In the all too real world of climate science, math, as I said earlier, matters. Every tenth of a degree of warming averted means less drought, less flooding, less sea level rise, less extreme weather, less lives lost, lives saved. We're already losing 15 million people a year to the quality or lack of quality of air. We lose 10 million people a year to extreme heat. That's 25 million people a year dying because of choices we make or choices we avoid. Now, I've spoken many times about positive mitigation efforts announced on the road to Charm. And I would be remiss if I didn't express some disappointment in the mitigation outcome of COP27. First, the collective decision, collective decision, coming out of Charm, the one that sends the political message from all parties to the Paris Agreement, was simply not ambitious enough. And when we are in the middle of the decisive decade for reducing emissions, we cannot afford to take a one-year holiday on our global mitigation efforts. Second, some of the top emitters of greenhouse gases did not heed the Glasgow call to strengthen their 2030 targets this year. And so I say with clarity, not because it's my opinion, because it's true, we cannot continue to have an effective process if countries simply choose to ignore the agreements of a prior COP. So how do we get to where we need to go? I'm reminded of a story about Senator Fulbright because a freshman senator by the name of Joe Biden wanted to become a leader on foreign policy. And he went to see the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. And chairman Fulbright told him, if you want to make a difference on foreign policy, you're in the wrong place. Go down the hall and see the chairman of the Appropriations Committee. He controls the money. A half century later, folks, not much has changed. Fulfilling climate commitments, of course, requires finance. And the United States and our partner governments are stepping up, but believe me, all of us need to do more. I can't think of any issue that has rattled me more in the course of the last few years than this question of money. I've sat with the presidents of Nigeria, of Senegal, of the DRC in the last months, and had them say to me, Mr. Secretary, we would love to be able to deploy the renewables. We'd love to not have to go for the gas that we do have. But you're telling us not to exploit the gas. You tell me what my alternative is and how I'm going to deploy it. Where's the funding to help us be able to deploy? When only 17% of our country has electricity, we don't have a revenue stream to try to, 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 to make that a bankable deal. We need concessionary funding. My friends, we have to excite trillions of dollars to enter into this arena. Again, not because I say so, the UN report on finance and every other analysis, McKinsey Company and others tell us we have a deficit of two and a half to four and a half trillion dollars per year for the next 30 years in order to affect the transition. You want to win this fight? You want to keep it to 1.5 degrees? We have to find a way to be able to put this money on the table and make a difference. And no government in the world has enough money to make that happen or will allocate it. The private sector does. So we have to create the bankable deals. No one, believe me, has been beating this drum harder over the past few years than His Majesty King Charles III, who together with business leaders founded the Sustainable Markets Initiative, which is a way of bringing the private sector to the table and helping to define the blended finance and other mechanisms by which we can deploy 
the trillions of dollars. And in keeping with those goals, we announced at G20 in Bali and Indonesia's new commitment, amazing move to an accelerated clean energy transition. The United States and partner countries have pledged, we've put up $10 billion of concessionary and other kinds of money through a just energy transition partnership that will leverage an additional 10 billion in private finance. In Sharm el-Sheikh, we saw Egypt's new commitment to shut down natural gas plants and scale up renewables. They're actually gonna shut 11 turbines of gas. They're gonna transfer that gas to Europe to help Europe through the tough winter because of Ukraine. And they're going to deploy 10 gigawatts of solar and wind. <clears throat> That's a net 15 gigawatt transition in the direction we need to go. But guess what? It took us a year and a half to negotiate one arrangement. We don't have time to do that. We've got to find this money, put it into the marketplace, and begin to create the carbon market capacity to be able to help make a difference with environmental integrity, obviously. So renewables made some of this possible because Germany and the United States committed $250 million to support Egypt's country platform for what they call NUEFE, the nexus of food, water, and energy. And our support is gonna unlock $10 billion in commercial investments. In addition, global philanthropies have joined the fight and have pledged a half a billion dollars to replicate these energy transition models around the world, which will drive enhanced implementation and enhanced ambition. It all works in a holistic, comprehensive way. And we know there is no substitute for finance from contributor countries and public funds. But we also need a massive infusion of private capital. That's why the United States, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Bezos Earth Fund, have introduced the concept of an energy transition accelerator to speed the transition from dirty to clean power in developing countries. And over the coming year, we're gonna engage with governments, with companies, with civil society, all the relevant stakeholders in order to turn this concept into a reality. There's only one thing this concessionary money will go for, or two pieces. One is for the closing of coal and the transition to alternative energy, renewable, wind, and solar. That's it. And it's clear we can find an environmentally uh, righteous, you know, a, 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 an enlightened approach to this, which doesn't allow greenwashing and, and uh, the games that have been played in some quarters. So my friends, as we work to reduce emissions and avert emissions and, and avert the consequences also of a runaway warming, we obviously have to help vulnerable countries in the world, island states that may disappear, Bangladesh and places where, you know, two thirds of the country is two feet above sea level. We have to work on the challenge of the experience they're already having. And it would be disingenuous, which is what President Biden decided and we decided. You can't sit there as a developed country and say there aren't losses, there aren't damages. Not when <clears throat> 17 of the 20 most vulnerable countries in the world to the consequences of climate crisis are in Africa. And yet 48 sub-Saharan African countries equal a total of 0.55% of all emissions, while 20 countries equal 80% of all emissions. It's not hard to find a concept of equity and fairness within that kind of a framework. So in Sarm El Sheikh, we <clears throat> launched a call to action to the private sector to mobilize their action and finance supportive adaptation efforts and building of resilience. And we responded to the UN Secretary General's call for early warning for all by committing to more than $40 million to help close the early warning gap and including new resources for the island states in the Pacific. <clears throat> we also contributed, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, my post-COVID croak, but I'm not contagious. Uh, we also contributed to the Global Shield Against Climate Risks and to two UN funds that provide humanitarian relief and help protect migrants with a particular focus on climate change. So in Egypt, 
The parties also addressed what has understandably become more and more of an issue over the last years, and that is the issue of loss and damage. And the COP specifically focused on setting up a process to establish an array of funding arrangements related to various aspects of loss and damage, including extreme weather events and slow onset impacts like sea level rise. We converged in a one-year process which will look at the existing funding arrangements, identify gaps. We moved it from two years to one year. We signed off happily on the idea of this being an agenda item, which requires that there must be an outcome. We have an outcome, and we will, I am confident, get a further outcome. But we need to come up with new arrangements, including the fund for the benefit of developing countries and particularly vulnerable ones to climate impacts. We look forward to constructively working in this important process. I have the privilege of having our chief negotiator, Sue Biniaz. Many of you may know her or know of her. She's been to every single COP, and I think she's the world's biggest expert on these issues. And we have specifically characterized our approach to this as one of cooperation and solidarity as distinct from an approach involving liability or compensation. <clears throat> and I say that representing the nation uh, that proudly under President Biden is the largest humanitarian donor in the world. So there are, in all of these things I just described, my friends, <clears throat> there are the green shoots of progress. But the bottom line is, and you have to be candid about it, no one is moving quickly enough. The question of China looms large. Following President Biden and President Xi's meeting in Bali, we have restarted climate talks with Beijing. And due to the compressed time for our negotiations uh, and the fact that I was sidelined in the last two days, we were not able to complete uh, those talks, but we're going to continue them. And China is at one moment the world's largest manufacturer and deployer of renewables. Think about that. Deploying renewables today at a pace that far outdistances most, any of us. But there are still areas where China and the United States could cooperate to be even more effective and to accomplish more in both of our interests and in the world's interest. We are back at the table to try to follow through on this, recognizing that China is emitting three times the amount of emissions that we are, 30 percent of all emissions in the world from one country. Obviously, in order to solve this problem, we must cooperate together. We must build on our mutual commitments in the joint Glasgow Declaration, including China's commitment on phasing down coal consumption, taking action to reduce methane emissions in the 2020s, illegal deforestation. But time is short, and I hope <clears throat> that China will ensure that its NDC addresses all greenhouse gases, particularly methane, and will align its 2030 target with the Paris temperature goal. And as I've said before, the climate crisis is not a bilateral issue. It's a multilateral global issue. Reducing emissions in time is about math, and that's why all nations have a stake in the choices that China makes in this critical decade. The United States and China should be able to accelerate progress together. We want to not only for our sake, but for the sake of every country on the planet and future generations. My friends, our, our priorities on the road ahead are very straightforward. First, we must continue pressing for all major economies to align their 2030 targets with 1.5 degrees centigrade and to fulfill those targets by halting the construction of new coal, accelerating the deployment of clean energy, slashing methane emissions, and halting deforestation. Second, to deliver finance for climate action at scale, we must press for the multilateral development banks to evolve for the 21st century. This would unlock hundreds of billions of dollars for lending. The MDBs have already stepped up to their work of helping countries transition their economies, but we need to make sure that their operational models are fit for the purpose to tackle this crisis. 
That needs modernization. It needs to happen, I hope, as soon as possible by even the spring meeting, if so. And third, most importantly, we need to demand urgency and accountability from everyone, everywhere, every day. There is no mystery about what we must do. The real mystery is why it remains a fight to just do what common sense and science tells us we must do. We have a roadmap. We need to follow it. The question is not whether there is a solution. It's how to more rapidly implement the solution that is staring us in the face. And if we do that, we actually know that the future is cleaner, greener, healthier, and safer if we can get there together in time. My friends, I ask you just to remember what Nelson Mandela once said, it always seems impossible until it is done. Let's get it done. Thank you. What an incredible lecture. So we're going to have a quick response now from Baroness Helene Heyman uh, from the House of Lords. So I'm going to invite you up first. Thank you very much. Um, that was extraordinary. Um, thank you for inspiration and for hope. Um, I was going to thank Kings for their hospitality, Fulbright Commission for inviting me to take this on. But actually, coming to the podium straight after John Kerry is not a job that you should thank anyone for giving you. I heard Secretary Kerry speak once before. It was um, summer 2021. It was, I think, the hottest day of the year. It certainly felt that way because we were in a greenhouse at Kew. It was another extraordinary bravura performance. Tonight he's with us, and I understand it's going to be the coldest night of the year in the UK. I, I think that Secretary Kerry actually brings his own microclimate with him <laughs> to ensure that his audience is focused on the issue of climate and the crisis that faces us. And from everything you said tonight, sir, it's absolutely clear that we need that focus and we need it now. It is, as I say, inspirational to hear you speak about what can be achieved. It is something that makes all of us stand back and take a breath to hear you speak of the dangers if we don't take action. And what I wanted to talk about just the little bit is how we actually turn that fantastic oratory that we heard tonight based in real aspirations real international agreements, real possibilities because of the ingenuity and the investment and the understanding that has gone before. How we turn that into the urgent action that we need. You spoke of yourself as a recovering politician. I have some sympathy with that in the... Um, bizarreness of British politics uh, and British Parliament. I was a party politician for many decades uh, and then became Speaker of the House of Lords. And from that, I took up a position of non-partisanship uh, 
and have never returned to party politics. But I might be an ex-politician. I'm a very current parliamentarian. And I think maybe in a few minutes when we have the conversation, we can talk about some of those challenges of turning that rhetoric into reality in a domestic setting. As you said, every country has to face this, but every country has to work out their own solutions. Their challenges are different. They may be absolutely existential, like small island states. They may be the challenges of developed economies, such as your own and our own, of persuading populations of their long-term interest in <coughs> taking action. Uh, in the House of Lords today, the Archbishop of Canterbury opened a debate on immigration and asylum. And he ended it talking about the possibilities and the overwhelming issues, challenges, problems that the world will face if we don't take action on climate from climate refugees and climate movement. So for me, the difficulty of having leading a group in, in the British Parliament, a cross-party group, bringing people together, is actually the day-by-day -day slog of persuading a government that is committed that actually this has to go through everything. It has to permeate every policy, every piece of legislation. We have to look at pensions and we have to look at the health service and we have to look at procurement. We have to look at financial services. We can't just say, oh, we've got an energy bill. And the more fundamental problem, of course, it's not been a good week, actually, for the UK government and climate. The fundamental issue is how we persuade government to raise its eyes from the immediate and to raise its eyes from the politically advantageous today or tomorrow or in the next by-election to the issues that are long-term rather than short-term. And that's a real challenge, and it ends up with the embarrassment of actually agreeing to a new coal mine in this country for the first time in 20 years. So for me, the challenge is how we enact all that we need to do and how we manage to make what's being done in science, what's being done in technology, what's being done in finance, what's being done, all the exciting developments, all the possibilities, all the opportunities for sharing knowledge, for creating a better future for our children, for our grandchildren, how we do that and make the sum of the parts of what everyone is doing all over the world greater than the individual efforts that are being made and how we create the structures to do that and to galvanize our countries and our world into the action that's very clear from what we've heard tonight we need. Secretary Kerry, we often hear of the difference between optimism and hope. Optimism, that rather passive belief that everything will turn out right. I don't think any of us can be optimistic in that sense. Hope is different. Hope is more active. Hope is 
the sense that you can achieve this, but the knowledge that you won't achieve it without doing something yourself. I think tonight you have given us hope. And for that, thank you very much. Fantastic. So um, my name is Franz Burkett. I'm a professor here at King. So I'll convene a short conversation now between the two of you. And then there'll be an opportunity for a few, just a very few questions from the audience. So perhaps you could prepare those and I'll look out for that. So Secretary Kerry, maybe I put that challenge to you. I mean, I think you talk very inspiringly about the journey of possibility and you were full of all those examples of initiatives. And you mentioned the 1.8 target that came out of Glasgow and now 1.7. But then you also have Antonio Guterres coming into Sharm talking about 2.6, his, his fear that that was actually where we might mm -hmm. end up. And I suppose <coughs> as a climate researcher, I fear that that may be where we could end up. So how do you grapple with the challenge here about actually getting the reality of achieving 1.7, 1.6, overcoming the many, many obstacles that there still remain. What do you think is the sort of crucial thing that needs to happen? Well, I think crucial is to, is to uh, <clears throat> mobilize and organize uh, and proselytize <laughs> with respect to um, this truth that I've talked about. I mean. One of the things I didn't do tonight purposefully, because, partly because of time, you're already proving yourselves to be hard arses sitting here for a long time tonight. Um, and I respect that, but I, but I don't want to abuse it. Um, but there is a whole picture here of the upsides. I talked about it in the last sentence, if you will. Greener, healthier, uh, safer. The reality is that, that this is a choice between all upside and all downside. And somehow, as I said earlier, people aren't choosing or aren't connecting the dots in order to make that choice. Uh, politicians, some of them craven in various parts of the world, including in my country, have been exploiting this, scaring people, lying to people, telling people that, uh, you know, this is going to leave you with the inability to turn on your television set, or you're going to have to stop eating meat and stop eating. No, you do not have a choice here between a less quality of life and more. You have a choice between what is inevitably going to be a diminution in your quality of life if we just let things go. Every economic analysis has shown uh, your own Sir Nicholas Stern has written brilliantly about this, and others, Joe Stiglitz, and others, that, that it is far more expensive, by far, <clears throat> to do nothing or to avoid our responsibility than it is to meet our responsibility. And so if you really want to talk about spending money, I mean, sit tight, because all of our taxes will go towards undoing the damage or meeting the, 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 the crisis. And if you look at the potential of Africa, for instance, losing its food production capacity, I mean, what happens when 100 million people are trying to move? You think that Syria and, and <clears throat> the war there presented Europe with a major challenge to its politics because of the infusion of migration of what happened? You wait till you see what happens when there are tens of millions of people knocking on the door because you can't live in the other place anymore. That is not outside of the realm of the predictable here. And so we are indeed right now on a track to above 2.5. That's the track we're on. Why? Because the things I talked about that we could be choosing to do, we are not fully implementing. We are not cutting emissions fast enough. We are not transitioning fast enough to where we know we need to go. So it's all doable. But we have to choose to make it happen. We have to make it happen. And we have to force accountability in the political system. That's where I began my life. Maybe that's where I'll end it. 
is fighting to have politicians stand up and do what they're supposed to do. You know, I, I asked the question coming back from Vietnam, how do you ask a man to be the last to die for a mistake? Well, how do you ask anybody to die here for, for the, the consequence of our inactivity? You talk about morality in politics and morality in life, this is about as compelling as it gets when 25 million people are already dying as the consequences of the choices we're avoiding or the choices we're making. So, you know, this is uh, about as serious a moment as it gets, folks. You, you all, as Fulbrighters here, are being presented at your, you know, incipient stage in life with some of the most profound uh, choices that exist in the realm of human endeavor where we try to balance how to govern, how to live, what is correct, you know, what is right, what is just, uh, with, with uh, all of history. And that's what's on the table here. Can I ask you another question, which is... No. <laughs> <laughs> you said, you know, in your, you, you made, in your conclusions, you, you said three things, we need to do three things. The first is to align 2030 targets with 1.5. And crucial to that is obviously the large emitters. And I suppose China is particularly important there. So I wanted just to dig a little bit deeper Great. in the restarting Good. of the negotiations with, yeah. uh, between the US and China. Well, Could before I go to China, more, let right. me share with you, if I can, a perspective on this, which actually I think gives us hope. I mean, it gives me hope. I said to you earlier that let me frame it this way. 20 countries, I said this earlier, equal 80% of all emissions. You know, there was, a, there was a famous bank robber in the United States called Willie Sutton. And he was once asked, well, why do you rob banks? And he said, well, that's where the money is. Uh, so 20 countries, <clears throat> 20 countries equal 80% of all the emissions. So where do you go for the emissions? You want the biggest bang for the buck? Go to the 20 countries. That's what we started out with our strategy with President Biden the minute that I assumed this job. And I told you today, we got 65% of global GDP committed to 1.5 degree track. That's Canada, Japan, Korea, US, EU, UK. The, all just those countries equal 65% of global GDP and are responsible for a majority of the emissions. You add China to that with 30% of the emissions and India with about 7 or 8% and Russia with about 5 or 6% and you suddenly got big stuff going on. So if you can get more of those countries moving, so who else is in that constellation of 20? Well, who did I mention today? Indonesia. They've moved. Mexico, they're moving. Uh, uh, India, they're moving. India has a goal of about 500 to 600 gigawatts of renewables they want to deploy by 2030. And we want to work with them to try to help accelerate that process. Well, guess what? If India were to hit the 500 gigawatt level of deployment, they would be in keeping with a 1.5 degree track. So. I see possibility in moving that other percentage. So with the advent of Australia, Vietnam, Indonesia, Mexico coming on board, we're now above 65, 65%. We're at 70 something percent. And if we can get China, Russia, India to meet its goal, uh, and, and uh, a couple of those other countries, South Africa, we have, we've been working a deal with South Africa. UK has been leading that effort. Uh, if we can get a just energy transition partnership deal with South Africa in place, and we're close, we're not there, but we're close, and we can move Brazil, which is now, I put it, I told you, they want to come in and renew their vows, so to speak. Um, so folks, all of a sudden you get up to 85, 90% of that 80% of emissions. That becomes doable, particularly if we can hit the, the, the mark of coming in with 
the new technologies. Let's say we do get cheaper electrolyzers. We bring the cost of, of green hydrogen down to about a dollar per uh, kilogram. And then, you know, all of a sudden you're going to see that hydrogen kicking in all around the world. Lots of countries pursuing green hydrogen. So we're on the cusp. There's about a trillion dollars overall of venture capital chasing these different technologies. And if we can begin to excite that even more, which is what you know, Prince William's Earthshot is geared to, a million pounds of prize to some entity that's changing life. They just awarded one to, cook, to, to clean cooking in Africa, where these stoves are going to replace having to go out and get wood and burn charcoal and so forth. These are things we can do. And every single one of you graduating from the Fulbright program can go help implement these programs, help to put these in place and accelerate them. That's what gives me hope, that, that there is a scalability here that actually could achieve what we need to achieve. And remember, it doesn't all have to happen in 2022, 2023. You have to be on a track where you can see that you're actually going to be real by 2030. The science tells us we need a 43% to 45% reduction in emissions by 2030. Not by tomorrow, but by 2030. Well, we're on a track to try to hit 50 to 52. And we just saw Indonesia raise its promise to 43%. And we need to help them do it. So I think, you know, there's a reason to combine hope and optimism, maybe. Fantastic. With an eye on the time a little bit, are there any questions? So I'd privilege a Fulbrighter. If a Fulbrighter has a question, then I will give them the priority. Anyone, anyone in the yes here? Do you want to stand up quickly and identify yourself? And uh, yep, yeah, there's a microphone here. Hi, my name is um, Sarah, and I am a Fulbrighter at Royal Holloway, University of London. And um, thank you, Secretary Kerry, for your fantastic talk. Uh, my question is, how can younger generations who will um, live with a greater consequence of climate change constructively communicate with older generations on the urgency of the issue? <laughs> Forcefully, adamantly, immediately. <laughs> uh, you know, you just have to enter the conversation. There are all kinds of ways. There's no one way to do it. You, you're going to have opportunities through, <clears throat> you know, what you're doing within the framework of university and your studies and so forth. And when you get out of there, uh, be, be activist. That's the most important thing. You just can't be indifferent to it. Uh, you got to organize. Elections work, actually, by the way. Look at what happened in the United States in our midterms. Uh, it, it was a reaffirmation, really, of the fact that people can make choices, and they did make a choice. Climate was the number two issue in our midterm election in the United States. I was really surprised by that, and I'm heartened by that. So I think, you know, you've got you to combine it with, uh, obviously, the need to put some food on the table, but also the need to uh, get the process working better. And then one more question, perhaps at the back, the back here. Yes. And remember what Winston Churchill said, government, you know, democracy is the worst form of government except for everything else. <laughs> Important. Please introduce yourself. Uh, uh, hello, my name is Sham. Um, thank you very much for such an inspirational talk. Uh, my question is that you've talked a lot about um, what governments are doing and what they're trying to do in order to reach these targets. And my question would be, how can we as the public um, help to try and achieve these targets? You can make choices in everyday life, the things you do, you know, how you're living. Uh, are you... I mean, as simple as, uh, I mean, I've become an addict in turning out lights in the house. Uh, you know, you just take, do the little things and do the big things. What kind of car are you driving? What, what are your, you know, habits? Are you contributing to actual sustainability? I mean, one of the problems we have is we live in a world, and I want to be careful as I say this. I don't want to get framed in the wrong way, which is what happens. People don't want to have a legitimate debate. They want to pigeonhole you. But 
sustainability is really a critical part of this. And no country on the planet is really living actually sustainably. Uh, and we've gone up to 8 billion people on the planet, and we will be rising to 9 to 10 over the course of the next 20, 30 years. Um, you know, I believe in the marketplace, but I, but I believe not in robber baron capitalism. I believe in enlightened capitalism. And that means, uh, you know, we've always had safeguards, at least in our country. The safeguards are the Supreme, have been, <laughs> have been, emphasized the Supreme Court and the Commerce Clause and the Constitution and other things. That may or may not be up for grabs now. We have to wait and see. But the truth is that we've always had to regulate certain behavior, certain things. Excess is a human condition, and some people practice it more ruthlessly than others. Uh, and that can create imbalances in the system. We have to fight back against those imbalances. But, but how you allocate your capital has to be properly incentivized sometimes. That's what the IRA does in America. The, the, the Inflation Reduction Act actually creates appropriate incentive for investing in renewables, in alternatives, an investment tax credit, a production tax credit, and that will affect choice. And it will be one of the most effective ways in which people are now going to allocate capital. So you, you need some of these guideposts. And I'm afraid that in the last years, unfortunately, uh, in our country certainly, uh, many of those guideposts were torn down in a reckless way uh, without regard to what the impact would be. So we have to restore a sense of responsibility to our day-to-day -day life and to what we do with capital and how we encourage it. Thank God there are good actors in that regard, people like you know, Bill Gates and, and uh, uh, so many others who've been very blessed in, in their enterprise and who are pledged to give away their fortunes in the course of their lives in order to make a difference in charity. And it's having a profound impact on the options to be able to win this battle. I think we're going to bring this discussion to an end because time moves on. I do want to bring attention once more to <coughs> a very useful piece of public opinion polling that was done specially for this event. I mean, and, and relating to the question, actually, in the United States and, and the UK, there is this huge awareness and awareness of the urgency of the need for climate action among, uh, amongst people in, in the US and the UK, actually. People are willing to uh, make sacrifices, pay the cost of this, because they understand the long-term benefits will be enormous. So I would urge you to have a look at this very, very interesting research uh, and actually, it's very hopeful, I think, the outcome uh, of this work. Can I, can I just add to that very quickly? Sure, just sure. Shortly? You, you'll see, in, in America now, we've learned that because of the pace of what is happening, we're going to actually be, be deploying clean energy uh, about four times faster than we thought we were. Uh, and, and about you know, a huge percentage of our new power coming online, 75 80% now, of the new power in America is all coming from renewable. So the marketplace is making decisions here. And I believe, you know, look at Ford Motor Company and General Motors. They've spent tens of billions of dollars retooling their plants. And they're not going backwards. There will be no more combustion engine cars in the United States being fabricated, new ones, as of 2035, and a 50% goal by 2030. So, the, you know, California alone is making a decision, which is the fifth or sixth largest economy in the world, and what California does, the rest of the country is going to do, because the manufacturers are going to produce it, to sell it in California. So things are happening. There really is much more going on out there than people think about. And I think there's reason to take hope in that. Fantastic. Right. I think I'm going to draw this bit to a close. Um, thank you so much for that. Really amazing. And I'm going to invite Sarah Grote-Sorel onto the stage to give the final... Vote of thanks. Thank you, Professor Berkout, for moderating such an engaging discussion. And thank you, Baroness Heyman, for illustrating how it will take all of us to put climate policy into practice. And a special thank you to Secretary Kerry.
for so eloquently outlining the daunting challenge and pioneering solutions that lie before us, reminding us of the urgency of this moment and that the opportunity is as great as the threat. It is no surprise that President Biden appointed you, sir, to lead the U.S. response to this moment. Some are called to carry a unique share of history's challenges, and it is a responsibility that you carry with grace and gravitas that is widely admired. Of all the positions you've held, this will likely leave the longest legacy as you na navigate one of the greatest challenges of our time. As chair of the US-UK Fulbright Commission and as a citizen of both countries, I'm incredibly grateful to Secretary Kerry and Baroness Heyman for honoring us with their presence and their prose this evening. It is a privilege for me to have the opportunity to thank you both on behalf of Fulbright and our esteemed partners at King's, Edinburgh, Pembroke, Oxford, and the Lois Roth Foundation. The annual Fulbright Distinguished Lecture is always a special occasion for the Commission, since it's one that exemplifies a key part of our mission, bringing together the diverse perspectives of our two countries and facilitating transatlantic dialogue and collaboration on critical global issues. The immersive exchange of our US-UK program deepens understanding of the other country and fosters the kind of compassionate leadership we so desperately need to confront the climate emergency. I wanna pick up on what Secretary Kerry said about the uniqueness of the transatlantic relationship in addressing this particular challenge. The problem we face is not British or American, it is universal. Yet, the solution lies in our shared ideals as nations and our unified ambition to lead with them. Ideals of innovation and science, progress and excellence, and that the idea on our most pressing problems, excellence must be achieved collectively. It is those same ideals that led to the establishment of the Fulbright Program 75 years ago at the conclusion of World War II and it's those values that still guide our work today. It's about the belief in continual learning and in the power of education to advance knowledge and to use that knowledge to address humanity's greatest threats. Our nations have once again arrived at a pivotal moment in history. On both sides of the Atlantic, individuals and institutions have played a leading role on climate mitigation and adaptation on policy and finance on convening and negotiating, and we will continue to do that far into the future. Both Secretary Kerry and Baroness Heyman spoke about climate change, not only as an environmental issue, but also as a human issue. And they spoke of a vision that places collective impact at the center of the global response. We cannot stop until we realize that vision, and doing so is a journey we are on together indeed. Our thanks once again to Principal Kapoor and the team at King's for hosting us tonight. You are an invaluable ally, and the same holds true for all of our partners and all of you. Thank you for being here tonight and for all you do to support our work and protect our planet. As you leave tonight, keep in mind what Secretary Kerry has said, that this is the task of our times, and it's one that transcends politics or party or place. It is the decisive decade, and we must engage because we owe it to everyone on the planet. Thank you, and we look forward to continuing the conversation in the foyer just outside the auditorium. Good night.